Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and I was chatting with my husband uh, over the weekend about the topic of today's episode, uh, which is really, do you have a homestead or just an expensive hobby? Um, We talked last week about how to start homesteading where you live and um, some new skills that you can learn to become more self-reliant, which isn't ever a bad thing. But this was a really interesting discussion between my husband and I because it really raised that question of what makes you a homesteader? Um, Maybe it's producing food to feed you and your family. Maybe it is raising livestock. Um, Is it making do, fixing, recycling around the home and garden? Um, Perhaps it's acreage. Um, Perhaps it is being able to wake up and get out of bed and, and see, you know, fields upon fields, right? right? There's lots of different things that kind of come up when we think about a homestead um, and what makes us a homesteader. Now, you might see a homestead, um, a small holding and a hobby farm as the same thing. And they kind of are. There are different names um, for it. Um, Typically, these three, so a homestead, a small holding and hobby farm, um, they only produce food for themselves. They do not make um, a profit um, with selling of things um, from the homestead. Whereas if you have a farm as a business, you are raising um, grain or vegetables or fruits. Um, If it's a ranch, you're raising uh, livestock for meat. Um, Maybe you have, you know, you're raising animals for dairy. Um, If you're doing it for profit, you have a farm. Um, But when it comes to these type of um, uh, lifestyles, I guess, so a homestead, a small holding or a hobby farm, you're doing it for yourself and your family. It's not for a profit. Um, you might also call it subsistence farming. And a typical homestead is really designed to create self-sufficiency and self-reliance for a family. And that definitely kind of jives with what we're trying to do at home. But we kind of think that a homestead versus an expensive hobby is a little bit deeper than that. So let's talk about some common pieces that are on a homestead. And first of all is a garden. Now, every homestead, whether it is in the middle of the city or in 20 rolling acres, has a garden that produces food for the family in some capacity, right? It might be a little herb garden, it might be a tower garden of veggies, or it might be a mass of raised or in-ground beds that are being used for fruit, vegetable, herbs, and grain production. Either way, there is some sort of garden that is producing food for the family that are living there. Number two is compost. So things are not wasted on a homestead. All which was once living becomes soil to fuel the garden. Worm composters are really popular in apartments and small urban spaces. Um, Pallet sized composters are great for bigger gardens, right? Either way, kitchen scraps, fruit peels, coffee grinds, tea bags, junk mail, newspaper and anything else that you find on the homestead ends up in the compost pile. Uh, number three is livestock. So even in the city, I've seen livestock, right? I've seen small beehives. I've seen quail. I've seen chickens, rabbits, even doves or pigeons being kept. And the homesteaders that I met and saw worked within the boundaries of the city to have something on the property that produced a source of food from an animal or an insect like the bees. Now, some homesteads don't have livestock though, especially if the homesteaders are vegan. Um, They don't, you know, use animal amendments in their gardens either. So that means no manure. Um, But typically they have some level of, of livestock. Number four is saving and reusing. Now, I know I mentioned already that things are not wasted on the homestead, right? Homesteaders are repurposing items and saving things all the time. It might be using the manure from your livestock to compost, 
getting something secondhand in a yard sale or at the thrift store and turning it into something new or fixing it up to be able to use it a lawnmower maybe or woodworking tools perhaps or even a garden cart right or just some examples other examples are making raised beds from recycled materials um, scraps of old jeans being used for patches repurposing clothing material into a quilt is another example other times homesteaders save things like mason jars for canning and of course seed saving like saving seeds to grow the following year so if you're not following the old saying um and this one's my husband's favorite is use it up wear it out make it do or do without then you're probably just a hobbyist number five is knowing the difference between pets and livestock every homesteader that we've met knows the difference between a pet and a livestock animal now i understand it's easy to get attached to a cute baby goat or a fuzzy bunny or a fluffy chicks but they have a greater purpose on the homestead maybe it's milk eggs or meat either way it's food and if you're raising livestock for food then you have a responsibility to give that animal the best life that you can because it's going to make the ultimate sacrifice and whether you're culling and butchering yourself or the abattoir does it for you the animals you raise as livestock are going to be making that sacrifice with their life so that you and your family can continue yours and have a source of food and i know that sounds all very much doom and gloom but that is very much um, a reality check of a homestead versus a hobby and you might just have an expensive hobby if some of these resonate with you so if you're buying new things all the time right if you're buying new things all the time in the latest gadget you might have a hobby um if you're throwing things in the trash rather than turning them into something new or even compost right if you're you know let's take a box of salad for example those containers along with some toilet tubes make a perfect uh, seed starting setup for things that don't like to have their roots disturbed when transplanted so think things like squashes pumpkins watermelon melon cucumbers all that sort of stuff right you might also have an expensive hobby if you named your livestock um that, that goes back to the previous point that we mentioned about knowing the difference between a pet and livestock um if you're buying transplants every year rather than growing from seed or you're buying seeds every year um that might be an expensive hobby um another indicator is that if you want the farm life without the hard work um i don't know a farmer or a homesteader um or a small holder um or you know even a hobby farmer who says that it's easy um it is um, a lot of hard work but it is um thrilling in a different kind of way and very satisfying for a lot of people another indicator are that you're more concerned about the appearance of the homestead rather than productivity like you can have a nice looking garden and a nice looking homestead um, but if you've got um, a lot more concern about what it looks like rather than how that's producing like how it is producing food for you or um, producing the things that you are trying to uh, succeed at on your homestead then it might just be an expensive hobby and the last one is if you're buying soil or compost from the big box store rather than making your own and i know a lot of us go to the big box store it's convenient right it's perfect for getting our garden set up um but it's expensive and um you know you can make your own you can make your own compost right at home and that's why composting was number two because every small holder or homesteader or a hobby farmer um, that i've ever met they all have a composter in some way shape or form right and having an expensive hobby really isn't a bad thing if you're honest with yourself and maybe your family um but know that it really is different from homesteading homesteading has a lot of ups but it also has downs and um one that i can think of from our homestead is um it's a, it's a down um unfortunately but um you know i realized that i couldn't call the chicken i named right i and i know i've talked about this on on the podcast before about um some of the mistakes that we did as newbie homesteaders and um yeah i named the chicken 
Um, she was called Ginger. I named her after Chicken Run. <laughs> um, and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't call her. And we'd raise them specifically, dual purpose, for meat and eggs. And she was, you know, the chickens were no longer producing the eggs. And um, it was, it was time. And my husband, um, my husband could call them, but I couldn't. Um, I could help afterwards with, you know, the, uh, you know, defeathering, the plucking, and the the jointing and all that stuff the butchering um but i couldn't i couldn't do uh the culling and i really admire um the homesteaders that i've met who can um do that including my husband i can i definitely admire that he could do that eating the chicken that i had named was really difficult as well um because on the one hand you know i felt really bad that you know there was this chicken that i'd named on the other hand it was really delicious. So I, I was really, um, I had a lot of mixed emotions about it. And, um, because that whole process was really difficult, um, it's one of the reasons that I gave up meat. And, um, I feel that if I cannot see the life cycle or the cycle of life, um, through with the livestock that I've raised and the life that I have given them and, you know, being able to have access to organic food and, you know, forage and all that good stuff. If I cannot see that life cycle through, then I have no business eating it. And I know not all of you are going to agree with that statement, but that's my personal feelings on the matter. And that's why I gave up meat. So if I'm not eating the livestock, and let's say my family weren't either, that is some expensive pets to take care for. And that's money that could go towards something else. Maybe it's a bill that I have, or maybe it's something more exciting, like funding a vacation or buying the bigger canner that I really need, for example, right? There's a, there's ongoing costs involved with homesteading, um, things like feed and bedding if you don't have it readily available on your land. And sometimes that can turn into a few thousand dollars a year if you're not careful. The setup costs for homesteading can also be pretty expensive and not something that we typically talk about and that's kind of why you know homesteaders start to think a lot outside of the box and kind of really embrace that you know use it up wear it out make it do or do without mentality because we're wanting to be recycling things um, around the property to turn it into something new and something useful and um you know, because things can get costly, that's why farmers do a lot of math, right? They need to know the return on investment for the food that they raise. And have, you know, if you ever take a trip into a farm or feed store, you are probably going to hear somebody complaining about the cost, right? And, um, we hear it all the time when we, when we would go in and, you know, it would be somebody complaining about the cost of alfalfa or the cost of hay. And it soon adds up. And that's part of the reason why homesteaders do it outside of the box, get creative with what they already have to keep those costs down. And I really want to know from you in the Facebook group, what makes you a homesteader, right? There's, like I said, there's so many different ways to homestead. There's as many different homesteaders as there are people on the planet. So I want to know from you what makes you a homesteader. Um, the link, if you're not already in the group, is in the description that goes with this podcast. Just make sure that you answer the questions so my team knows to grant you access to the group. I should also talk a little bit about resilience because homesteaders, smallholders, hobby farmers, they're all pretty resilient people. Not only are they really creative with using what they have around them, but when things go wrong, they're pretty resilient to bounce back and keep pushing forward. And that's one thing that I want you to take away from um, today's podcast. And I know it's, it's a lot shorter than usual, but really, you know, keep moving forward, right? And that's the only way that we will truly succeed in, in the lives that, and the journey that we're taking when it comes to growing our own food, raising our own food and homesteading, um, you know, even in the suburbs, right? Is just to keep moving forward. If something doesn't work out right, you know, what can we do to change it? And how do we keep pressing forward? And when it comes to growing our own food, 
you know, raising food, homesteading, whatever we want to call it, there isn't truly a failure as such, or what we might think of as a failure, right? We either win, like something's going really well, or we learn something from it, right? I know I talk about this a lot, but not every garden is successful 100% of the time, right? Sometimes there are plants that do really well in a year, and sometimes there's plants that, you know, the previous year did really well, but, you know, this year they totally sucked, right? Things happen, and what we can do to, you know, stop feeling those setbacks so much when we're trying to raise our own food is to plan for it and have diversity. And that's one of the the key things that I see, you know, smallholders, hobby farmers and homesteaders all doing is they have diversity, diversity in what they're growing, diversity in what they're raising, um, diversity in how they use those items um, or, you know, the, the produce that they're creating, um, diversity in how they, they use, um, things that are on and around the homestead, right? And even diversity in their skills, right? You know, you gotta get good at, uh, doing basic repairs and things if, if you're a homesteader, it just kind of comes naturally. So I want you to, take heart if you have a or you're thinking that you have an expensive hobby but you want to move more into a homesteader practice and keep moving forward. I hope your garden's growing beautifully and I will see you all next week.